East Comic Con Seattle. We are having a great time. We have a big day today. A lot of great people coming across the stage. And right now, I'm very happy to welcome one of them, an old friend of mine, Cheo Hadari Coker. Hey, what's up? <laughs> How you doing, man? It's good catching up, man. I mean, we, we go all the way back to the Los Angeles Times. Yeah, we wrote at the LA Times together for years. And, uh, but now you've gone on and you're doing TV. Uh, yeah, which is, which is crazy. <laughs> I was a big fan of Ray Donovan, your stuff that you did on Ray Donovan especially, but now you're back in the Marvel universe, you know, as a Marvel fan growing up. Uh, how cool is Luke Cage Power Man? Well, I mean, it's really an amazing time. I mean, that was the thing about when you were first covering it in the LA Times about the fact that, you know, we as, as geeks, like, not only do we exist and do we have strong opinions, um, it's basically become an industry. And the thing that's been really interesting is the fact that when you were covering it, it was still comparatively small, but now here we are. I know, it's, it's huge, it could never be bigger. And what I love too is it's become more sophisticated, more nuanced, and more satisfying. You know, it, uh, I think even when Christopher Reeve was Superman, we all knew that the ideas were fun and that the imagery was great. Uh, but now, fast forward all these decades, and now the, the scripts and the performances, they live up to the aspirations of, of the audience and of the talent. Well, that was the thing was, you know, for me, reading graphic novels, um, probably the one that really, you know, pushed me over the edge from being just a fan to actually wanting to write was, um, you know, the Chris Claremont's God Loves, Man Kills. Oh, it's fantastic. You know, um, and that one, it's interesting because that, that also became the theme for the X-Men movies in terms Absolutely. of with, with understanding Magneto's perspective much more deeply as, as well as, as what Xavier is talking about. And, it's a, it, and if, if there's anybody in this audience that hasn't read it, it's so worth reading. Brent Anderson, I think, did the art. Yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds right. And uh, I just remember uh, the playground scene with the children, uh, 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 mutants who had been executed and... Uh, just it, the, it jumped off the page. It was so powerful. Well, the thing that was interesting about that scene was that I remember this as a reader. I, I don't even know how old I was, but I'm, I'm probably like the same age as my sons now. Like, I think. Yeah. Probably. So that I was, I was 12 years old. So I'm the, the exact same age that my my children are. My two of my of my three kids are um, my twin boys. And it, the thing that struck me about it was that there were these two black kids that were running from, you know, the cops essentially. Yeah. They get killed. And then that, there's a panel when Magneto is holding them crying. And it was, you know, it was, first off, I mean, because you didn't see a lot of, you know, African-American, like a huge African-American presence in comics. That was, stri that was one thing that was striking. Sure. But it, it, was, it went past race because it, it was, he was, you know, as homo superior, as a mutant, he was mourning the loss of one of his own. Yeah. And, the, you know, the fact that it wasn't about color, but at the same time, the subtext is also there. It was, it was... It just made you go, man, like this is, this is going beyond a comic book, this is deep. And, and it really just kind of opened me up to an entire world of, of the possibilities of what comics could be. And it's something that I constantly think about um, in our writer's room in terms of the kinds of stories that we tell and the places that we can go. Because, you know, the thing is, is that comic books have always transcended um, what people think that they can actually do. Absolutely. And, and Marvel has uh, the, the richest tradition of dealing with race in comics. I mean, Black Panther was the first black superhero. Uh, the Falcon was the first African-American superhero, because obviously right. Black Panther's not from the United States. Um, and you look that Black Panther was created within weeks uh, of Bobby Seale in Oakland creating the Black Panther political party, right. and separate and distinct. I mean, they, they, they weren't influenced each other. They almost came out of the air at the same time. And, that shows that Marvel, even though it was primarily white Jewish guys who had careers started in the 40s, they, they in the 60s, were still mm -hmm. somehow tapping into the energy in the streets and, and finding a way to turn it into pop entertainment. It, it's really pretty extraordinary. But it, it goes all the way back to those same white Jewish guys that created Captain America and Superman as a reaction to World War II and the Nazis right. and what was happening to relatives overseas um, in the Holocaust and wanting to have a hero or, you know, in a very subversive way, subversive from the standpoint of, you know, there being ramp rampant anti-Semitism, both domestically and overseas, yeah. to, to create two characters, Captain America and Superman, that were a reaction to that. Um, you know, and having that subtext, even though the grand majority of the fans m might have missed, you know, the, the, really the um, double consciousness of the characters, it's no different than what, you know, 
we do on Luke Cage from the standpoint of, yes, it's a, you know, an authentically or, or what I call um, inclusively black story where you can just view it as a fan, but then if you want to look for deeper themes, they're also there. Sure. And now the heritage of Luke Cage is fascinating as well. I mean, uh, by the, the 70s when we first saw Luke show up in the comics, I mean, very clearly imprinted by black exploitation. Um, I mean, the costume was fantastic. The, the headband, I've tried to rock it. I really, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tough look for me, but it's, it, he's, he's a character that when he arrived, along with the Kung Fu comics and, the, and Dra Tomb of Dracula stuff, it was very influenced by what was going on in cinema, but not the big studio stuff, the more, the edgier stuff. Well, it's, it's, the, it's really kind of the whole influence of, of Times Square. Yeah. It's the influence of young writers going to the Marvel office, and passing through Times Square, which, you know, really back in the 70s was just like, you know, the movie Taxi Driver. Yeah. It was that raw, it was that crazy. It was really like that really up until the early 90s. And so, that was the biggest influence. I mean, you had black exploitation movies, you had, um, you know, a lot of the Shaw Brothers Kung Fu movies, yeah. and all this, and really also kind of the birth of, of hip hop. And so all these things are happening simultaneously, and young comic book writers are looking around them and saying, okay, we don't have a black character like Shaft, why don't we invent one? Right. You know, the whole Iron Fist is, is it's, a, it's a direct influence coming from everything from, you know, Enter the Dragon to the Shaw Brothers movies to, you know, some of the stuff that the Wu Tang Clan eventually sampled, yeah. like those kinds of movies, kung fu on TV, you know, and so all, so it all kind of comes from that. Yeah. And um, the one thing that, I, in terms of modernizing Luke Cage, but at the same time really embracing his black exploitation roots, all black exploitation is, from my perspective, is African American characters getting to do the same thing that their white counterparts got to do all the time. So, which is basically, you know, get the girl, have the, have, you know, have the win and you know, look cool kicking ass. Absolutely. You know, and so it, it, down to when you first go back to like um, the poster for Shaft, one of the taglines on, 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 the, on the Shaft poster is, well, I think it was hotter than Bond, cooler than, cooler than Bullet. There you go. And so what we did for season one was we wanted to kind of embrace the black exploitation roots of the character, but you know, go in different directions at the same time. Yeah. You know, it wasn't about shying away from it, you know, and, and that's why, of course, we still have Sweet Christmas and, and we still have, you know, <laughs> certain elements. I mean, the tiara makes that one appearance, but, you know. Uh, and it's, and you, you look at Point Blank, yeah. for instance, uh, and if it had been black folks, it would have been called black exploitation. If it's white folks, it's just called movie classic. Right. You know? True that. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about music. Uh, I'm a big music fan, I know. Yeah, More than huge. fan uh, with your background and, and expertise. Uh, do you see this show uh, and the season two dropped on Friday? Yeah. Congratulations. Which is why I look so so tired because I've, I've I've been up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, super super excited about season two. We, we um did a um a, a great um premiere in New York where we had Karis One and Rock Him and um, Jada Kiss and Faith Evans um, performed. In addition to Adrian Young and Ali Shahid Muhammad, our music supervisors are also called. They're also a band, The Midnight Hour. So that that album is is incredible. So you definitely got to peep that as well as the um. Season two soundtrack, um, which is out right now, and we have a, an original song from Rakim, um, which we feature in the in the uh, 13th in, in the finale of, of season two. Oh, um, so music to me is is really it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to communicate um, just a feel, a vibe. Um, it's almost its own character. Yeah, it is. For, for me, it's like the influence for me is um, I think a lot of people think that where our biggest influence in terms of having a club inside of the show is um, New York Undercover. But actually, it's the Francis Ford Coppola movie, The Cotton Club. Oh, fantastic. You know, yeah. because we want to, you know, the thing for me is that Harlem is both, you know, Las Vegas and Washington, D.C. in the same place. You have politics, you have, you know, you have, you have all these incredible performances, but then, of course, when you, when you have all that mixed together, you also have gangsters. And so it just really is just an incredibly rich environment to explore the history of, of, of black America, but also a really cool place to place a superhero. Yeah. And so the music's all over the place and it's just really just kind of having all those different influences, everything from, you know, Nina Simone and Mahalia Jackson to, you know, Rakim to Wu-Tang to, I mean, just the whole gamut of, of, of music. Um, and then our performances in terms of our musical performances are, are really great. And then everything from, Picking the sequences of the um, of the show in terms of the songs, it's ba it's basically sequenced like an album, um, because I realized early on that the way people binge, 
the only experience that, like, that I remember from back in the day is, like, say, for example, like, Prince or, you know, De La Soul or, you know, like, Quest or you know, like certain artists, you know, their albums were so comprehensive, you would literally shut down your day and you would listen to the entire album twice and then you would talk on the phone, back in my, date myself on the phone. To, you'd have a cord on it. You know, to, to your <laughs> friends about it. And then, you know, and now really the equivalent is, is how people um, react in terms of watching it and then immediately, you know, texting and tweeting or even having wa viewing parties. Oh, that's really very insightful. I hadn't thought of that, but you're exactly right. Like, we don't really have albums drop the way people used to, like, if someone had a big album coming out, Yeah. you know, everybody knew about it, everybody cared, everybody lined up and got it, and you're right, that really is, it's, but it's also, it's not at a movie theater. Right. You know? I mean, and that's the thing, is um, everything is kind of, it's kind of beginning to transcend, because nowadays, you can get a 65 or 75 inch television, you know, still expensive, but not as expensive as they used to be. And when you are, have like a, a, a 4K Dolby Vision experience like that, you're, you're beginning to approximate the experience that you, that you would get at a movie theater. And so as a result, um, particularly the way that these shows are shot, these, 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 yes, they're television shows, but they're shot cinematically. And having had the experience of, you know, doing premieres and watching them on screens as big as the ones behind us and, and also on small screen, you, you really are making 13 movies to a certain extent. But also to kind of extend the album, um, you know, um, metaphor, uh, there's been talk about, okay, are these Netflix, you know, seasons too long for, for Marvel shows? You know, 13 episodes being too long. The way that I look at it, honestly, is I kind of look at it like a double album, um, you know, and there are going to be those people that, like, for example, I mean, for some people, you know, Twist and Shout, Love Me Do, that's their Beatles. For other people, it's the White Album, it's Abbey Road, sure. you know. I, I really feel like we're more trying to do the latter than the former. Yeah, definitely, definitely white album. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. You know, it's really interesting that you said Cotton Club. I hadn't really thought of that. Um, you know, I thought of Carlito's Way. Oh, th that one too, yeah. You know, which has a great, and, and Casablanca and, 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 and Scarface where you have clubs yeah. and that, that idea of, you know, this is a place where bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. Right. You know? Well, no, I mean, you know, without revealing too much about you know, the future, those movies are definitely favorite movies of mine. So I, 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 I want to be very careful. I, I don't want to make the mistake that uh, others have on the stage. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> where they might have revealed too much. Exactly. But uh, safe to say that, you know, Casino, you know, Carlito's Way, Casablanca, um, you know, are all favorite, are also my favorite movies. Yeah. And also those movies are, have an incredible use of music. I mean, Scorsese is a, you know, Scorsese and Spike Lee are, are probably two of my biggest influences in terms of you know, pairing music to narrative. And um, for me, like, I kind of, and I consider, like, um, Scorsese a rock and roll filmmaker, and I aspire to be a, a hip-hop showrunner um, and use music in the same way. And also what I love about Scorsese is that he knows his era, and his era is really, you know, the 70s. And he doesn't really stray too far past that because he, he stays in his lane. And for me, my lane is, is 90s hip-hop. So it's not that, I, that I'm not into other things, but that thing is, you know, something that I have a really deep understanding of, um, because the fact of the matter is, is that Issa Rae and the way that she uses music in Insecure or the way that, that Donald Glover uses music on, on, on Atlanta, I mean, those are incredibly, you know, current, if not, you know, really setting trends. And like, I know that I can't compete on that level, uh, you know, because bo both of them are geniuses, and not to mention the fact, I mean, they're also in their shows, and, 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 and they can freestyle. I can't do any of that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but at the same time, you know, what I embrace is, is, is what I know. And, um, but at the same time, I'm also, like, trying to expand, the, you know, the, the sonic plate of the show because that also expands story. So for Bushmaster, who's our new villain for season two, it's just as much an exploration of Jamaican music as it is really um, a storyline and, and a culture. Um, in addition to really having a very interesting villain for Luke Cage to go up against for the season. Absolutely, and, and if, you, uh, if you go from New York to Jamaica, you put together uh, dub and the sidewalk music of the late 70s uh, in New York, I mean, that's the template for all the hip hop. I mean, that's a fascinating place to start right there. Well, that, Scratch Perry and oh, Grandmaster oh, Flash. You know? Yeah, well, no, that, well, it's crazy because um, it's actually the Scratch Perry version of Sun is Shining is the, um, 
is the, is the version of that Bob Marley song that we use for the, um, the fight on the bridge in episode six of, of season two. Um, but that was really the really definitive influence was if season one was, a, was about the quote unquote Wu-Tangification of the Marvel Universe, season two it really is about the you know, history of hip hop. History of hip hop because of Cool Herc, you know, Clive Campbell who actually immigrated um, from Kingston, Jamaica to the Bronx and really brought with him the whole tradition of you know, using a sound system and albums you know, to be the equivalent of a band. Um, which nowadays seems like normal, but back then was it's new. It's Sonic new. alchemy. No and one's done it. And so that's the thing. It's really, if you look at the roots of hip hop, it's it's the blues, funk, and soul tradition from America, with matched with the you know Jamaican sound presence and and perspective and kind of the war or melding of, of both of them. And, but we're using that metaphor to really look at you know the Stokes Dillards from the South, the American South their immigrant experience from immigrating from the South to Harlem, and then also tying in a, a backstory with Bushmaster um, and the Jamaican um, you know, immigration experience from, from Kingston to, to New York. And you, have, you basically have musical strings, you also have a great thematic string. And when you put these two families fighting over the past and Luke Cage in the middle of that, that's really the whole crux of season two. Now for kind of a nerdy question, since I can do that too, right? Um, tell me about Luke's power and strength compared to some of the other folks in the Marvel Universe. Like, because you have to have these things calibrated in your mind, like what he's capable of, how tough his skin is and things like that. Well, the thing is, I mean, like, it's interesting. I mean, th th and these are where some of the arguments happen. Yeah. Um, because in the Marvel television universe, you know, Luke's strength will probably be the equivalent of probably just, uh, probably more than, than Captain America, but like, Really, in the comics, I mean, he, he sees like just under like the thing, the thing you know, yeah. it, he's, he's up there. He's, he's, he's right under the thing in Colossus and, and could do a lot more. And so, you know, knock on wood, if there ever was um, the opportunity to cross the character into the MCU, I think you would be able to do, a, do different things, do a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's kind of the reality that both Marvel and Netflix in terms of trying to put him into a world that's both realistic and quote unquote grounded, but you know, there are times when I, I, I wish that he could be the equivalent of the comics, but then, it, but then also strike that balance in, ter in, terms, of, in terms of the um, being on the television show. So it's to make it accessible to an audience and yeah. just keep it grounded. For the most part. Yeah, and then um, you know, folks have seen season one uh, and haven't seen season two because it's just come out. What would you tell them, uh, give us a little pitch of why they should check out season two? Um, season two really is an expansion of Luke Cage as a character. Um, one of the things that that I said in a previous interview is that you know super is what puts asses in seats. Human is what keeps him there, and so so really it's just kind of the combination of humanizing him and flaws. I mean, Luke Cage is definitely flawed this season, which which I, th I think um, it doesn't necessarily make him a more accessible character, but when you have the opportunity to have flaws in, a, in your hero, it gives you different windows to explore who it, who it is they are. And so this is the season where everybody gets to explore themselves, whether it's Luke um, because of his relationship with his father and Claire and also finally having you know, a villain that really can fight him on his terms, whether it's Bushmaster's story, whether it's Misty Knight's story, because she loses her arm in the, in the Defenders. And not only do, it's, it, we don't just give her her arm back, but we also show the struggle before she gets her arm and her questioning herself. Um, at the same time, you also have um, the expansion of um, Alfred Woodard's character, Mariah Dillard. Um, it's really just uh, the chance to look into all the d these different characters and to really kind of expand on an emotional level who it is they are. But then at the same time, I, I feel that um, there's more action. Um, the fights, I think, feel better. Um, you know, it's just got a different flavor to it. Yeah. It does have a very different flavor, and, and uh, I think it's a great upgrade. Like, oh, it's really strong. Um, for me, I came to, uh, to love Power Man, Luke Cage, from uh, the Frank Miller side. Yeah. You know, reading uh, Frank Miller's great run of Daredevil, and uh, we talked a little bit about this before we came out here, but, like, right when the whole bullseye and Elektra, like, leading up to 181 issue where Elektra dies, um, Luke and, and Danny Rand would show up 
as not comedic value, but they, they were almost the ones that kind of like, whoa, these guys are intense. What's going on here? And, and uh, I found them extremely uh, accessible. Yeah, no, because you know? that was kind of the, the run that when I was, you know, as a comic book fan, that, that was when I discovered, you know, from reading, you know, that Daredevil run of, you know, of Frank Miller's. That, that's when I, that's around the same time that I got into Power Man and Iron Fist. And also, um, for me, like, the Frank Miller run of, of, of Daredevil is, around, is really around the same time I read the Chris Claremont Frank Miller, wo you know, Wolverine limited series. September 82, the same month that Thriller came out. Yeah. Wolverine number one came out. I was like, There's, that's a cool. <laughs> yeah, it is. Oh, you don't hear that pointed out oh, very often. Thriller and, and Wolverine number one, same month. Well, because then, cause, cause then for me, it was like, you know, that collaboration, getting into Wolverine is what led me deep deep into X-Men, yeah. but then after I got to the point where, where I really began thinking about who's writing and, and who's drawing, I mean, that was really Frank Miller, Chris, Chris Claremont, John Byrne, you know, that whole run, and then of course I got into New Mutants, and, yeah. and um, you know, it just spins all these different directions, but, uh, you know, safe to say that because Luke Cage would pop up in different places, he was always a character um, in the back of my mind, so when he was resurrected by Brian Michael Bendis um, in, in the Alias graphic novel, which of course is the basis of Jessica Jones. It's spectacular. Um, and the fact that they were gonna turn, you know, that run and a few other things into what became, you know, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, Daredevil, um, Iron Fist, and eventually, you know, The Punisher as, as, the, as the Marvel Netflix collaborations. When they were looking for people to, to work on these, I, like I, I, from the very first announcement, I, I remember saying like, if there was an opportunity to do Luke Cage, it's something I, want, I really wanted to do. It's a sweet spot, and those comics are great. You know, and they just and they hold up really well. And Miller, um, you you know Frank, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, he his stuff has been so influenced by cinema. I mean, you know, yeah. Clint Eastwood films and and all the films that we've been talking about went into those comics, and then they those comics came out, and it's it's fascinating to see how it's all sort of bundled up and and kind of turning in on itself and and creating these new opportunities. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Also as a writer, not just, not just as an artist, but as a writer, when, when you look at, um, you know, Hard Boiled or, you know, Dark Knight Returns, you know, Sin City, I mean, all these things um, are a definite influence on, on you know, myself and, and, uh, and you know, my, my fellow, you know, writer producers on, on the show, because we definitely reference those. And if you want to basically talk about season two, the same way that the Dark Knight Returns really you know, offered up a very different Batman. Sure. You know, even though I, I, I might get in trouble for, you know, comparing a, a Marvel character to a DC character. But at the same time, I mean, that comic run, it really influenced virtually every single superhero iteration after because you really could, between what he was doing and Alan Moore, I mean, you, you really could humanize heroes and villains in a different way. Yeah, and year one, Batman year one, which came out yeah. uh, in 86 also. I mean, that was an unbelievable year for comics. It was Watchmen, uh, it was uh, Batman Year One and Dark Knight all came out in the same year, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, definitely. I remember that right. Um, that's fascinating. And then for you, what? Tell us something that um, you know. Sometimes we know what we want, and then we know what we don't want. Tell me what you don't want in Luke Cage. What What are some of the things that you want to avoid with the character, either uh, aesthetically or philosophically? Just uh, you. You can't really say that you can't avoid anything because you don't really know what the character is until you're confronted with it. And so I, I always try to keep things open. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I, I can't say there isn't anything that we won't do or that we won't try. Um, I'll just know when, when, we, when we're up against it, you know, what that is. I mean, I think that the main thing is that I don't want it to get to a point where um, we're not able to challenge the actors, you know, that we're lucky enough to have. Um, because, for, you know, whether it's, whether, whether we're writing for, you know, Mike Coulter or Simone Missick or Theo Rossi or Alfred Woodard or Mahershala Ali uh, or Rosario Dawson, um, because they're such incredible actors, we always want to make sure that they're challenged by the material and, and really love it and, and are not just there to, to collect a paycheck. So really, I, the main thing is um, we always want to make sure that we are exploring enough themes that we're, we're not playing it safe so that it's as interesting um, for the actors and the directors that come in as it is for us as writers to, you know, to, to come up with all of it. That's great. Well, you know, we're going to take some questions from the audience. If you guys have some questions, we have two microphones. There's, they're set up and they have yellow tape on them. Uh, makes it nice and easy to see. Uh, hey there, how you doing? What's your name and where are you from? 
Hi, I'm Connor from Massachusetts. Well, welcome. Hi, um, and my question is, um, are there any other Netflix shows, are there any other Marvel heroes that you would like to make Netflix shows of? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm, because right, right now there's probably a sniper somewhere from Marvel out there or, or, <laughs> you know, the red dots or, you know, or, or, or you know, Jeff Lowe might, might, might pop up somewhere. Um, no, I, right now, and this is not me, me being, you know, political, I, I, I love Luke Cage and, um, you know, hope to continue with Luke Cage. I, like, I haven't really thought about other characters yet, but it's, it's a fun place to, to work and a fun place to play. Howard the Duck, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Just saying, Howard the Duck, right from the get-go. See? Whack, whack. Uh, how you doing? What's your name? Where are you from? Uh, my name is Alex, and I am from Lakewood. Welcome. Hey. Thank you. Um... Am I allowed to ask two questions? Or yes, you may. One? Sure. Awesome, thank you. So the first one I was curious is, um, will you ever be doing uh, an explanation of when Infinity War takes place since the television universe is in the MCU, reportedly? Is, is that going to ever be explained? or? It's when half the cast turns to dust and they're <laughs> like, whoa, whoa. No, just well, it's in, okay, it's almost like Doctor Who. It's almost like one of these time travel things where, you, where something's a part of a universe, but there's kind of like things that are different. I wouldn't necessarily call the, the, the Marvel television universe an alternate reality that's connected to the Marvel cinematic universe, but they try to run a parallel track, um, even though there are going to be differences in both. I mean, at some point it will get resolved, but that's definitely way above my pay grade. So, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully as a fan, I'm, I, I apologize if, if the differences are frustrating. Um, but we really try to keep things, even when they're separate, as entertaining and as connected as possible. I mean, the one thing that I've prided myself on with Luke Cage is that we probably have the most Easter eggs that deal with the MCU within the MTU. And we always just try to have fun, you know, as, as much as we can. And, the yeah. sense, and so the sense of the music and stuff helps too, because it feels like it could have been a little while ago. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like it necessarily has to be the same day that no. Thanos shows up or something. No, no, correct. But you had a second question. Second question? Yeah, um, my second question was, uh, since Luke Cage is Power Man and we have seen Jessica Jones inside of the universe, um, I was curious, will we ever see a Power Man and Power Girl show, like Netflix show? Um, depends. I mean, the thing is, is like right now we're kind of taking our time and, and the show's being separated, but in the future, who knows? I, I'm, being, I'm being completely honest. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Hey there, what's your name? Where are you from? Uh, my name is Heath. I'm from Atlanta. Uh, I want to thank you for the Beatles shout out. I'm a big <laughs> Beatles fan. Always. Nice. Um, I want to be as tactful as I can with this question. Here we go. <laughs> uh, so recently, the um, Marvel Netflix series have kind of faltered in quality, if you will, uh -huh. um, starting with Iron Fist and... Um, the Defenders, and even season two of Jessica Jones, which was my favorite, season one was. Um, and Luke Cage really was like the definition of a slow burn for a series and made it really awesome. Um, can you speak to that at all? Is like why maybe um, the series are kind of dropping off a little bit and if you have hope for kind of the future of the, the Netflix Marvel Universe. Season, season two, Luke Cage feels like a, a, a turn around to me. Well, it, it depends. I mean, there, there are some people, I, like, I'm, I'm only going to speak, like, specifically to Luke Cage um, sure. yeah, yeah. rather than, than the others. But I can, what, the one thing that I can say, whether it's myself, whether it's, you know, um, Melissa Rosenberg, whether it's, um, you know, Raven Metzner, who is now the, the running um, Iron Fist, um, or Eric Olson, who's running Daredevil, it, it's, it's a relentless pace. It's a relentless pace, and at the same time, you're trying to um, maintain a balance of character and action, and then also um, different dictates from both Marvel and Netflix. Um, and so each of us as showrunners do our best to navigate all of that the best that we can. Um, the one thing that I'll say for Luke Cage season two is that um, I really was influenced by second albums like um, Ice Cube's Death Certificate, like A Tribe Called Quest, Low in Theory, like uh, The Fuji's The Score, um, like, um, you know, De La Soul is Dead, as well as um, the Beastie Boys' Paul Boutique. 
from the standpoint of you want a second album that has a that, that's different than in, that that than what's come before, but at the same time, in terms of what you're trying, hopefully is a level up, and I'm hoping that people you know regard it as being better than the first season. Some people critically have felt that we are, but there are also plenty of people that think you know. I, again, I go back to Alan Steffenwall, who says that our current series really does show the limitations of, of having 13 rather than a shorter episodic run. I mean, personally, I disagree with that. And I think that, you know, we really tried hard and I think that we succeeded in making the show faster paced and went in a deeper character direction. And I'm really hoping that, that people dig it. It's the Paul's Boutique of Marvel TV, Thank for you. sure. <laughs> yeah, cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> How you doing? What's your name, where are you from? Oh, yeah. um, I'm Melissa, I'm from Seattle. And hey. this isn't so much a question, but I loved the lighting so much in season one. I think it did so much to set the stage and create moods and sometimes almost acted as a character. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious if you have more thoughts about the lighting and how that played out in the show. Well, you know, Manuel Bilater, um is a genius. Um, he, and here's the thing. I mean, not only did he shoot season one of Luke Cage, he also shot season one of Jessica Jones and both are atmospheric and they, they both look completely different. Um, you know, I really loved what he did on season one of, of Luke Cage and um, also what Peter Hillemas, um, our DP for season two, um, also um, showed incredible nuance. Um, and you're right, I mean, the thing is, is that we probably shoot more daylight than any other of the Marvel um, television shows. And we do that because, we, you know, we really do want to have that contrast um, and I, I really love the way the show looks. I mean, and ho hopefully you agree. I do. I do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. How you doing, man? Good. Which, uh, which, my name's Nick. I'm from Marysville. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my question, how did you enjoy writing and directing Finn Jones? And what, whether or not you enjoyed, uh, do you feel like you caught the essence of Iron Fist this time around? Since his own show and Defenders were sort of they're still building him up, more or less? Well, the, here's the thing. I mean, um, Andy Goddard um, directed episode 10, and Akela Cooper um, wrote that, that episode. She also, that director-writer combination was also the same magic combination for um, episode 7 of season 1, uh, you know, which, which, of course, we still get flack for killing Cottonmouth, but that, that, that's a whole different story. <laughs> but the thing is... We didn't really concern ourselves with fixing Iron Fist or doing something like that. It was really more of a question of how does Iron Fist fit within our show? And because of the fact that we have Power Man and Iron Fist in the same place, like, and, we, and we're not burdened with you know, a story like Defenders where you have to you know, really give service to four heroes. Like, let's do a smaller story, but let, let, let us also, within this story, um, have it be that Danny helps Luke achieve something. And so that both characters are there for each other, very much like they, they are, are they, or they were in their own comic. And that was really the thing, was we just had fun with, with them. And, and that fight that they have um, in episode 10 is really one of my favorite scenes of the entire um, season. Um, and also, you know, for me, like um, being able to place Wu-Tang under that was fun. Um, just all the way around, I mean, I, I felt that, that, that Andy and Akela did an incredible job, and Finn was great to work with, and um, both Finn and Michael, Mike, Mike Coulter, who plays Luke Cage, have great chemistry, and that's the thing that you, that you never want to get past, is even when we have as many serious scenes as we have, because we have also have some really deadly serious scenes in that scene, I mean, in that, in that episode, mm -hmm. you also want to have fun. Because that's why we all collect. That, that's why we do the things that we do. That, that's why we're all fellow geeks and nerds, is that we love this stuff. And that was just really kind of a geek's dream come true, that, the, the whole experience. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yeah, you. The friendship in the comics. Three, so I look forward to episode 10. Thank you. Thanks so much. The, epi the, the friendship in the comics was just so fantastic yeah. because it felt effortless. Uh, and it was, it was rare. You know, it, you, there was really no other friendship quite like theirs. Mm -hmm. In the comics that well, I can think of. And also, this is, again, I mean, for us, that episode um, that, uh, you know, Akela did an incredible job writing, uh, you know, we really wanted to kind of explore like a kind of like a, a 48 hours kind of 
back and forth, or lethal weapon kind of back and forth bickering. One's a, and you know? one's a. So <laughs> in, in that case, you know, Luke Cage is, is, is either the Nick Nolte or the Danny Glover character, and Danny in this case is, is either, you know, more the Mel Gibson or, or, or um, Eddie Murphy, you know, character in, in that respect. Which is even more fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, how you doing, sir? Good, how you doing? I'm doing well. What's your name? Where are you from? Uh, I'm Tony from Spokane. Welcome. Hey. Uh, so, first of all, great show. Thank uh, you. With uh, complicated characters and deep storylines, which I really appreciate. Um, so, you've touched briefly on the music that's part of the show. And I know one of the big themes or metaphors in the, in the first uh, season was about Biggie Smalls. Right. And, and Cottonmouth. That went much deeper than just the King reference, and, and that's it. Can you talk a little bit about how you use that broader metaphor of Biggie Smalls with Cottonmouth? Is, is that something that was intentional? or? Well, it was intentional from the standpoint, this is interesting, because um, it was a personal homage to Biggie, because I, I knew him as a, um, as a journalist. I, I was one of the first people to ever interview him, and I was actually the last person to interview him before he got killed. Um, and he was always kind of um, in the back of my mind, you know, on my mind while, while doing the show. Um, the one thing that happened was we were initially in that scene in episode one with, with Cottonmouth, we were going to use Basquiat in the background, but we couldn't clear that particular painting that I, that I had in mind, which was Charles the First, and because it had, you know, it has this whole thing with the crown. But we knew that we loved the whole, you know, Mahershal, really Cottonmouth's whole crown speech. And so it was, a, it was a question of trying to think of, can we put something behind him that has a crown featured prominently? And then I remembered um, Dream Hampton when she was the editor-in-chief of Rap Pages um, actually had a Biggie cover. And Baron Claiborne, the photographer, um, shot Biggie with the crown. And then so we were able to um, reach Baron Claiborne to get the rights to that photo, blow it up. And then everything else that happened, like, uh, um, you know, this again shows the kind of happy collaborations that happened, but we're on set. Um, Manuel, um, the DP, first spots the angle, and then the director, um, Paul McGagan, realizes that, look, if Mahershala paces himself and walks to the certain point with this angle, he's gonna be, have the crown. And so, of course, I wasn't on set when this happened. I was putting on another fire, so I, I missed the most iconic moment of the, of the whole series. But this thing happened, and then, it was just a perfect match of, of, of what we had written, you know, him walking in, the crown, and then at the same time, the, the double meaning of, all, of it also being Biggie because of my personal involvement with the family and also having written a book about Big um, and being one of the co-writers on the movie Notorious. It was one of those incredible full circle moments that, uh, you know, still resonates with me. Oh, that's great. I, I feel like it was lost in some of the commentary that's been out there about the show, but it, it's a great metaphor and it's a great... Way to include it. That's awesome. No, thank you so much. Hey, how's it going? Hi. What's your name? Hi. Uh, I'm Ellen. I'm from Baton Rouge. I like your skirt. Thanks. That's you. really cool. Thanks. Um, as a fan, one of the coolest moments on your show and any of the Marvel shows is when we get to see um, the crossovers of the characters, and obviously the Defenders was a big one. Um, but obviously all the shows include it to some degree, um, more or less to whatever degree. And I was wondering, how is that dictated? Like, do you get to decide, like, is that decided by individual showrunners or by, like, higher Marvel powers that uh, be? Like, whether you get to decide whether Danny will be in this season or how, how does that go? No, well, okay. Without, I'm again, looking for Marvel snipers. <laughs> um, we're all, all, we all, all these shows are being written and filmed consecutively and planned simultaneously. And we're all in the same buildings, um, you know, back in our, in our, in our secret lair where, where we, we write and plan these shows. And so, at least on Luke Cage, we always have an open door policy. So um, while um, Marco Ramirez, um, and Laura Hishrich were, were working on, on Defenders or, um, you know, or um, Melissa Rosenberg with, with, with um, Jessica Jones. Like, we, we all know each other. And so there will be times when it's like, okay, at least particularly with season two, we're like, okay, this, it would be really cool if we could have Claire, um, not Claire, I mean, um, have Jessica, um, who, um, who plays, um, um, I'm sorry, um, from 
Iron Fist, um, the, the crossover with Missy Knight, um, the, the whole Daughters of the Dragon thing, like um, being able to have those characters collaborate or knowing that we could have Iron Fist in, in our 10th episode. And then really what it, what it is, is more of a question of then asking the powers that be, can we do this? And then them saying yes or no. It's never dictated that you have to have this character in this show. It really comes from us as showrunners saying, wouldn't it be great if we could have this crossover? Um, you know, the, the, the same way how, um, how Karen pops up on Punisher. You know, we all, like, you know, because Steve Lightfoot, um, if you want to inc include him a, 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 amongst, the, you know, all of us kind of talking, it's, it's really just about how each individual showrunner feels and wants a character. It's never dictated, you know, from, from Jeff or Kareem or anybody else. It's just really like, okay, wouldn't it be cool? And then they're saying yes or no. It kind of feels like the old Marvel bullpen probably. Yeah. Where, you know, you would be reading Spider-Man and Daredevil would swing through the back, you know, the issue, um, you know, something like that. Thank so, you so much. Thank Thanks you. for the question. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. What's um, your name? My name is Darren, and I'm from the Bay Area. Welcome. Um, so uh, I love Luke Cage. I binge watched it, and it's like a woke show for me. Like <laughs> I love the idea of like hoods up, you know, very very like Oakland, you know. So um, my question is like, for uh, if Luke and Danny were like walking in the park somewhere, what kind of rap music would he show this white boy? Well, the, the thing is, they're, they're, they're both hip-hop fans, so Luke's going to probably be into, like, OC. Yeah. Um, if he was listening to something from the Bay, he... Actually, no, Danny probably... Danny is probably the one that would be listening to hieroglyphics, or he would be the one, you know, that would be into, like, um, something else. I mean, it, it all depends. I mean, you know, like, of the new stuff that, that Luke would be listening to, like, I think they would probably both be arguing over J. Cole or Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> Um, you know, like, because Luke's definitely going to be old, old school, but then if he's going to listen to newer stuff, it's going to be Cole, Kendrick Lamar, it's going to be Pusha T, you know, whereas Danny's probably would be the one, you know, arguing about something else. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Schooly D would be <laughs> Schooly D all day. Hey, how you doing? Hey, good. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm from Duval, Washington. Two quick questions. One. Did you have any influence on how Luke Cage was used in the Defenders? And if you didn't, did you like how he was used? And the second one probably gets you a little bit into trouble. If the Fox-Disney uh, deal merge does go through, would you like to bring some of those characters into the small screen and be able to direct them? Um, okay, a couple, well, a couple of things. Um, I had, I mean, because we as all... Marvel showrunners, you know, like know know each other and, and are friends and consult with each other. You know, they would ask me questions about Luke, um, and I would, of course, you know, give my opinion. But ultimately, um, the Defenders definitely belongs to you know um, Marco and Doug Petrie, and I'm sorry, and Doug as well as um, Laura. And so it was really like. What they did with it, I, I I loved. So it wasn't like I had a direct, like a direct, like yes or no. But you know, here's a perfect example. It's like they knew that for the Defenders finale, that Misty was going to lose her arm, and they asked me about that. And so the thing that I said was, okay, if she's going to lose her arm in the Defenders finale, um, can we at the very least on Luke Cage deal with the aftermath of that? Because it would be a great run for Simone Missick as an actress to you know, be able to deal with the, with the ramifications of something like that and then get her arm. Um, the one thing that I asked is that, you know, can we spend time for her getting her arm in season two of Luke Cage as opposed to getting her arm right then and there? And so that, you know, that's the kind of influence. And so luckily um, it worked out for, for both shows in that respect. In terms of, you know, the MCU and the MTU, like, and the Fox and all that stuff coming together, I mean, the fanboy in me, absolutely. I mean, that that would be, that'd be the you know dream come true. It's certainly a lot more complicated than that, but you know, um, one can always dream. It'd be awfully fun to see Wolverine walk through the door one day. Oh yeah, that'd be, dope. <laughs> that'd be pretty Thank fun. Thank you. You're welcome. It's a great question. Thanks so much. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joel. I'm from welcome. South Jersey. Okay. And uh, my question was, uh, you found success in your life, and you've you know you become successful doing what you're doing. But prior to the success, was there a point in your life where maybe you was working a job every day that you had to get up, you didn't want to do it, it wasn't what you wanted to do, but 
Well, I, I, well, I, I still have those moments now, too. Yeah. <laughs> so. Everyone has those moments no matter what you're doing. But before you got to the point, like maybe you worked at, I don't know, I, I used to work in fast food one day. I hated mm -hmm. doing it. Yeah. Um, but you worked a job like that that was just beat. And it wasn't what you found yourself, like what you wanted to do. How did you push through and get up and do that every day to, you know, to make sure you had finances you need to, you know, follow your dream one day, to do what you had to do to find success? Well, the thing is, is, is that I always say is that, like, the first thing is trying to decide exactly what it is you want to do. So if you want to write, be very specific, you know, do you want to write television? Do you want to write film? Do you want, do you want to write comics? Uh, like, whatever that is, figuring out, like, asking yourself the very specific question of what that goal is. And then once you identify what that goal is, then, you know, for me, when I wanted to be a journalist, it was about, like, reading all the different journalists that made me want to write. Like, whether it was James Bernard, whether it was Frank um, Owen, whether it was um, John Leland, you know, you, you know, the, the, the early years of The Source and Rap Pages, you know, I kind of read as much as I could, and then I emulated that style. Um, and then also when it came to, for television, of course, it's like, you know, for me, studying David Simon or, or studying, um, you know, a lot of the things that, that John Wells did on, on ER and different shows, you just really kind of have to fig figure, per, first figure out that direction. But then on, on the practical level, then it's just a question of just, even if you are working somewhere where you, do, where you don't want to do what you're doing, finding five and ten minutes a day to really start, uh, you know, thinking about how you're going to get to where you want to be. Because what happens is you get so ground down that like, you, you give up on your dreams and you can't do that. And that's the hardest part is making sure that even if it's only for 10 minutes a day, you know, that you have this dream that's going to take you elsewhere, making sure that you're trying to step closer to it, honestly. Thank you. And you've, been such, you've done such a great job of reinvention as well. I mean, as a very successful journalist and then using all the things that you wrote about in journalism and the textures and of the worlds that you walked in and, and understanding the music and the, and the cities and then applying that to your, your art now. You know, I mean, so that's a, a tremendous job of reinvention you've done. Well, no, thank you. I mean, the thing is, is that, like, at least on the writing side, like, all writing is is it's formats. Yeah. And you just, and the same way that, that writing a column is different than writing a record review is different than writing a, you know, a screenplay, which is different than a teleplay. It's really just about mastering each format. But the writing is, all, is always tough. It's all, it's all the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's never fun, is it? Ever. No one likes writing. They just love having written. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody loves having written. How you doing, sir? Uh, doing very well. Um, I was just curious, compared to, like you said, you have to be very direct about what you want to write. Um, and we've kind of talked about the MTU versus the MCU. And, you know, with the, with the movies, you have a lot more spectacle and a larger budget and, you know, a, a much wider audience. But you get to tell deeper character stories and really make it that longer journey. You know, what, what is your perspective? Like, if they had offered you a Luke Cage movie as opposed to the series and knowing what you know now, kind of the pros and cons of each medium... Well, I mean, each, each is different. Like, the, the difference between a, a, a movie or a movie screenplay and a, and a, and a teleplay, for a movie, it's, it's about trying to capture a moment. You know, it's really trying to capture a moment, you know, when the star is in, a, in, a, in a, you know, kind of in an existential crisis. And, you know, can you get past this moment in their life in, in two hours? As opposed to a show where you're trying to tell, you know, 13, or in this case, 13 hours, like, where, how does your character evolve? It's, they're each different. Um, you know, I can't say that one is more satisfying or more fun than the other. Like, to do a Luke Cage movie would be amazing, but I also feel that these last 26 episodes have been incredibly fun as well. So it just really just kind of depends, honestly. Okay. Thank you. It's that classic uh, story versus character. I mean, film is driven by what happens and yeah. television is driven by wh who it happens to. Exactly, exactly. Hey there, how you doing? Hi, um, I'm Claire. I'm from Edmonds, Washington. Hey. And I was wondering if you ever have writing block for Luke Cage, and if you do, how do you get through it? <laughs> every day is writer's block. Like, every, every script that I personally have to write is finally when everyone's going to find out that I, that I don't know what I'm doing. And so you don't, I mean, to me, I think the perfect metaphor is it's that moment um, in the first X-Men movie when Rogue asks Wolverine, like, if it hurts every time he pops his claws, and he says, every single time. 
you know, but the thing is, is that you just know that after a while, it's just one word in front of the other, and that sometimes perfection is the enemy of good, and you just have to just keep writing, and, and then eventually you'll, you'll get a rhythm, and, and it's going to be okay. So yeah, I mean, so there, there are times when, you know, it's tough, but I've been, you know, within the world of Luke Cage for so long that it's, it's easier than other things that I write to do it. Um, and that's the thing that, that is really incredible about, you know, how we collaborate, you know, whether it's myself, Aida Kroll, Kayla Cooper, you know, Matt Owens, Matt Lopes, Ian Stokes, Nicole Morante Matthews, or Nathan Jackson, you know, our season two writing staff is that we're all a part of all these stories together. And so it makes it a little easier, but really it's just like, after a point, you, you're gonna get the angry phone call from Jeff Loeb, like, what's up, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you gotta get through it. <laughs> There's nothing that clarifies like deadline. No doubt. Everything clarifies on deadline. How are you, sir? How are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Giovanni uh, from Seattle. Hey, what's up? What's up? Um, so, one, so yesterday at work, was putting my day out, supposed to be about went to work from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. And um, I got to watch the whole season of season two. Oh, great, cool. And um, the one thing about Bushmaster, he reminded me of KRS's uh, The Bridge is Over, of how his uh, power basically, sorry, y'all. So it's like how KRS once said, man keeps on making it, Brooklyn keeps on taking it. Yeah. Uh, Bronze Cage Creator, Queens keeps on faking it. He's right. making it for Queens, so. And uh, that's what I took from that character. And how, at the end, how Luke is at his position now, it reminded me, well, it kind of brought me to, like, DMX is slipping. Like, how it's about to go into that. So I was wondering, like, would you think about bringing DMX in for next season to do that song, reflecting on Luke? Well, the thing about X is, as you know, I mean, X is constant brilliance, constant drama. So it would depend on what X we want to do. I mean, I've, I've always, like, perfect example, like, like, I had an entire plan to use X Gun Give It To You for, for um, to promote season one, and then Daredevil beat me to it. And then also, and I'm, 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 I'm gonna start, Deadpool beat me to it. And then we also had a plan to use Mama Said Knock You Out for season two, and then Deadpool beat me again. So, so, so whoever is in marketing at Deadpool, like, they, they know what they're doing on, the, on a hip hop level, because like twice, they beat me to the punch. So if, if we can get X for season three, I mean, who knows? And uh, one more, so one more thing. Um, sure. Getting, what's it like to get members of the legendary Wu-Tang Clan into the show. You had Meth in the first one who dropped the coldest freestyle I've heard in a long time. Then you had Ghostface, so who would you want to get next? RZA, Jizza? Well, well it's, it's always fun because, you know, I, I, I go back with Wu-Tang, I mean, what, since 1993, 94. So I go, like, I was one of the first journalists to, to write about Wu-Tang. Um, so for me, the fact that we got Meth season one was great, the fact that we got Ghostface season two is great. If, if we are lucky enough to get a season three, I mean, you know, it'd be interesting if we were able to get someone like uh, the genius, you know, your Jizza, who I, I think would be great. Thank you. No, you're welcome. That sounds like a good idea to me. How you doing? Hey, how's it going? What's your uh, name? My name's Gus, I'm from Seattle. Um, I'm a big hip hop fan, part of the reason why I like the show so much. Thank um, you. Uh, so I have a two part question real quick. Uh, First question is, what's your favorite hip hop album? Why is it Ill Communication by the Beastie Boys? And uh, my second question is, what is your uh, Mount Rushmore of uh, hip hop albums? Oh man, like, oh, see, we just got the flash for five minutes and, and like, I, I could spend five minutes <laughs> answering that question. Um, oh, I mean, for me, it's like album wise, it's Midnight Marauders, it's um, Ready to Die, it's uh, Death Certificate, it's, um, I'm trying to think what else, just album-wise, it blew me away. Um, Three Feet High and Rising, um, and It Takes a Nation to Millions Hold Us Back. Um, and then in terms of my Mount Rushmore of MCs, I mean, it's, it's Rakim, KRS, um, Cube, Big, and um, I wanna say uh, Slick Rick. No, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Slick Rick. That's yeah. fantastic. Nice. How you doing? Hi. My name is Catherine. I'm from Seattle. Um, one, I really love the show. It's amazing. I think the writing's excellent. I think the production's excellent. Movie, uh, music, acting, all of it across the board. One of my favorite shows. Thank you. Um, 
one of the things I really like about the characters that are on Netflix are they're very grounded, they're very relatable. They're not Tony Stark in a tower, being a billionaire, never having to worry about money for the rest of his life. They're, I gotta get, like, they're Luke Cage working two jobs just to pay rent in an apartment that's not that great. Um, one of the things I'm wondering is, are you going to pull, like, okay, not are you, are you interested in pulling some of the like hero for hire kind of storylines into it where they're kind of monetizing their skills mm -hmm. kind well, of thing? Well, we touched on that a little bit in season two um, in terms of like, oh, Bobby Fish has a great line, um, just because you're the woke superhero doesn't mean you gotta be the broke superhero. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, 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 and kind of like, you know, the fact is that the thing that's always made Luke different is that you know, at least in the comics, he wanted. To, you know, he 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 always wants to get paid. Yeah. And in our in our television iteration, that's not really as much of a factor yet. But it's something that's kind of on his mind. We we deal with it a little bit in season two, and knock on wood, if we get a season three, we'll also deal with it differently, because I think that heroes for hire or the hero for hire is something that's always like you know in the clouds. Whether or not it rains or not on see on a potential season three, we'll see. Thank you very much, and thank you for consistently putting out just amazing television. Thank you, thank you so much. Wow, fantastic. Well, and that's a great place to stop. What, what a treat to see you, my friends. No, thank you. It's always a pleasure. Well, well, well and, and also, I mean, I, very few people know this. Um, I, I, I live in Seattle, so, so to, 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 to be home. To, Hometown. To, to be here is great. Um, you know, I, I'm constantly between Seattle, Los Angeles, and New York, to, you know, just between writing the show in LA and we film when we film in New York, but this is home, and so it's really great to be here. And, yeah, and, th and thank you for being so welcoming, and you know, it's just, just really an incredible experience, this whole thing. Thank you. Ace Comic Con, give it up for Chao. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations on season two.